Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Dr. Cog's meeting of uh, October 16th, 2024. I'm Jeff Baker, and I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, first item on the agenda is if you'll please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Stevens, would you please call the roll? Oh. No. I just hung up because you pointed to that. Yeah. Oh. Hybrid meetings are uh, okay. <laughs> All right, sorry about that, everyone. Thank you so much, and we'll get started with the roll. All right, Steve Odoricio, Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Here. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. Adam Paul, Denver. Kevin Flynn, Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. Here. Lisa Ferre, Arvada. Sharon Davis, Arvada. Angela Lawson, Aurora. Allison Coombs, Aurora. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Here. Thank you. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Here. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Greg Mills, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. <clears throat> Todd Williams, C Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Earl Holen, Cherry Hills Village. Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Here. Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Evening. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Kim Wright, Inglewood. Emily Bayer, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sarah Dawn Pearlstein, Federal Heights. Ray Bird, Firestone. Don Cognac, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. I'm online. Lisa Jones. Online. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Josie. Uh, <laughs> Thank Wendy you. Padilla, Frederick. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Lisa Vitry, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Isaac Levy, Larkspur. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Marissa Harmon, Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck, Longmont. Present. Judy Kern, Louisville. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Mark Browning, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. I know she's here somewhere, so. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll move on. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Nicole Sterling, Nederland. Richard Kondo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Jeff Taborg, Parker. Terrence Kelly, Sheridan. Here. Thank you. Neil Shaw, Superior. Sandy Hammerly, Superior. Justin Martinez, Thornton. Roberta Ayala, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Claire Carmelia, Westminster. Present. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Present. Darius Pakba, CDOT. Sure. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Bill Soroy, RTD. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, everyone should have had a chance to review the agenda for tonight. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. Aye. I think that was a uh, aye for delay. approval, correct? Yeah, it was a delay. I'm going to take it as such, even though the motion does carry. Thank you. 
Um, next up is report of the chair. And I don't have anything to report. So uh, moving on to the report of the Performance and Engagement Committee, we have Director Conklin. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a meeting this evening to care of a couple of things. Uh, had a recap of the awards gala and our thanks to staff for being there and for that update. And uh, also the uh, committee continued to talk about nominating committee guidelines. Uh, we are not through with those yet, but we're getting close. And uh, we will be having a special meeting of p and &E on November 6th to hopefully get that wrapped up. Completes my report. Thank you. And now we have a report of the Finance and Budget Committee. We have Director Kondo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, three items. Uh, we obviously have a conversation about uh, nominating a representative to the nominating committee. That's still work in progress. And we authorized two resolutions, one for the executive director to negotiate uh, a contract for Trans Plus and Demand Trans. Uh, as well as a resolution authorizing Executive Director Rex to accept the option letter to extend um, use of ARPA dollars through June 2025. That's all I have the report. Thank you very much. Report of Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good, good evening to everybody. Um, I'll first start with uh, Medicare. Medicare open enrollment is just around the corner. starts on November 5th. And I want to take an opportunity to give a shout out to um, our staff, AAA staff in our ship, ship our, on our ship team, and that stands for State Health Insurance Assistance Program. And what those folks do, they uh, provide um, objective um, information to um, to Medicare recipients about uh, about the various programs that exist out there. Um, if you know of anyone or if you get questions of anyone that is interested in information, because we all know it's a, it's a complicated process, right? And there's a lot of different plans out there. And I will assure you that staff that are working on this will make sure they get the, the, the proper attention that they deserve. So if you know of anybody, just send them our way. We have the information on our website. Um, we also have a video on our website that kind of lays out the whole process and all that kind of good stuff. So just kind of an FYI. Um, speaking of websites, um, you know, as I hope you all know, we've uh, we've uh, we've upgraded our website a few months ago, um, and that's up and running now. And we were um, and we received um, an award for excellence in web design, uh, specifically the Academy of Interactive and Visual Arts announced their W3 website awards last week, and Dr. Cog received a silver award in the category of general government websites. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. In all seriousness, that's a big deal. It's it, it's a uh, it was a lot of work. It was a god I don't know two, probably two year process, wasn't it? Because during that time period, we had the accessibility law that came into effect to so to, as well. So we had to pivot a little bit, but uh, we're we're real proud of that. And this is a pretty prestigious honor, and we're we're congratulatory. Thank you to Communications and Marketing for all the work that you did. All right, Go-tober. Um, so it's the middle of October, and we're halfway through our, our Go-tober commute challenge, and this is an employer uh, commute challenge. Um, it's something we do annually to, to, for employers to support their staffs and promote sustainable commute options in the workplace. And uh, I want to thank all the, the uh, participating jurisdictions. I think we have 10 that are participating um, in it this year. And at the midway point, um, our highest performer, so City County Denver is leading the pack. Town of Castle Rock is in second place, and it's a neck and neck race between the city of Englewood and the city of Arvada, vying for that third place position. So, but thank you all for your participation in this. It's a pretty cool event, and we, I think we had 78 businesses signed up this year. That's a that's a big number for us. Um, so, stay tuned on the final results at the end of the month. Um, listen, I, I just wanted to mention a couple, couple of member events that I had the the privilege of attending over the last since the last time we met. Um, the first one was uh, Crystal Valley Interchange groundbreaking, which occurred um, on September 26th. Um, and a big congrats! I know another one here tonight uh, to uh, Director Tim Dietz and uh, Commissioner Teal for uh, for them shepherding this whole process. I mean, I you know anybody who knows Director Teal knows how, uh, how this project has been front and center for him for a very, very long time as he's been Douglas County Commissioner, but also when he was uh, Castle Rock Commissioner. So it's a big deal. It's a $144 million project, 
and uh, it's expected to be fully complete by early 2027. Um, there's a lot of ancillary projects associated with, and uh, it's a very complicated project, and, and uh, it's pretty cool that that's finally up and running. Also, I participated um, in the groundbreaking of the East Colfax BRT on uh, October 4th. Um, this is also a very exciting project to a lot of us that have been, in, been involved in, in this for a number of years. My 12 years here in this region, I've been, I've been uh, involved in, uh, in uh, uh, various aspects of this project, and it was going on. The planning work was going on a lot longer, a lot, lot before then. I'm looking at Jacob Rieger. I know he was involved in a, a lot longer than I've been. Um, it's a 280 $80 million project, um, so it's currently beginning construction and is expected to be complete by mid-2026. It's a big deal, and we're excited about it. And last but not least, um, last night um, we were invited uh, by Mayor Pro Tem Randy Wheel to give a presentation at Cherry Hills Village uh, Council, talk about our, our housing work that we're doing, most specifically about our, our um, regional housing assessment and the upcoming regional housing strategy work. Great conversation with their council. Um, real appreciative of the opportunity. We're, we're willing to take this on the road. So if any of your council is looking for, have a gap in your, in your work sessions that you would like us to uh, come, and, come, and, uh, come and present, we'd be happy to do this on this top, topic or anything else. So just know that offer is out there. Um, and we like seeing you out in the wild, right? I mean, we see you here, right? But we don't get to see you very much out in, your, uh, out, out in, uh, out in the wilderness. So we, we'd love to we'll have the opportunity to engage with you there, as well as your other council and commissioners. Director Flynn. I was just reading. Oh, I thought you wanted to. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, shoot. And last but not least, um, I just wanted to let everybody know, as you know, we were, um, uh, we were successful in our application for the EPA decarbonization grant, and we'll talk about that quite a bit tonight. Um, but we did receive word earlier today that our grant agreement with EPA has been approved, and they have obligated the fronts to Dr. Cog. So we're very excited about that, and means we can start moving forward. So that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. We'll move on to public comment. Um, up to 45 minutes of uh, public comment is allocated right now for eight, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Is there anyone in the room that would like to speak under public comment? I see no one making their, uh, their themselves known to me. Is there anyone online? Uh, I see no hands raised online, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. With that, I will close public comment for the evening. We have a consent agenda, which consists of the summary of uh, our meeting on October 2nd. It was a special meeting. Everyone should have had time to review that, attachment A. Um, if there are any questions, I would entertain any questions or, or corrections to those. Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Director Present. Starker, thank you. A second. Second, thank you. We had multiple seconds. Appreciate that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, that motion carries. Our consent agenda is approved. We'll move on to our action items, discussion of the regional housing needs assessment, which is attachment B in your packet. We're gonna be hearing from Sheila Lynch, the director of the regional planning and development. Good evening, Ms. Lynch. Uh, yes, okay. Well, thank you, Chair Baker and um, Hello, directors. We're very excited to be here this evening because it marks 
kind of the culmination of an incredible body of work that we did at Dr. Cog on our regional housing needs assessment. So as you all are well aware, we started a regional housing needs assessment almost a year ago. Um, we spent many evenings in this room having very informative and thoughtful discussions that contributed to the, to the development of that assessment. And in July, our consultant team led by Echo Northwest came and presented to all of you and presented kind of an in-depth um, presentation on the findings of the assessment. And then we decided to take a moment and um, spend some time with local government staff. We held a webinar in late July. We then held office hours with local government staff as they requested to really help um, uh, share the findings and make sure that um, that your staff were familiar with what is in the report and also one of our deliverables, which is an interactive uh, data dashboard. So now we're back and we are here to, to as I said, kind of close the loop on this great work. And our hope is that we can um, have an acceptance of the regional housing needs assessment this evening. So I've prepared just a few slides to just orient us into where we've been, um, where we're headed, so that we're all on the same page before, before we entertain a motion. Here we go. So our collective work in housing really grows out of our regional plan, Metro Vision. Housing was intentionally included in our last update to Metro Vision. And while at the time we were not clear about perhaps the specific steps we would take to further this work in housing, we did know how important it is to integrate housing into all of our regional planning work. More than three years ago, the Dr. Cog board began to contemplate how Dr. Cog may add value to the challenges of, of housing affordability in all of our communities. And the role for Dr. Cog and the appropriate path forward was a discussion of many work sessions and two board retreats. Another factor that came into play during this time is that the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill of 2021, in addition to unlocking tremendous funding for transportation, broadband, climate, it also added housing as a planning factor in what metropolitan planning organizations must consider in their transportation planning. Now, I'll pause here to just point out that that did not start or launch our thoughts about housing and our transportation planning work. We have been considering growth and development and growth in our residential sector for many, many decades in our transportation work. But we didn't enter this work lightly. We actually um, spent some time learning from other regions and we had one-on-one -on -one interviews with all of the communities listed on this slide. And we learned a lot. Um, some of it won't be so surprising to you. I think every community pointed out to us that we need to keep in mind how important our unique context in our region is. And that while housing affordability is a challenge across our nation, and there's certainly some commonalities about why that's happening and perhaps strategies that we may take on that you'll see in other cities, there are some unique contexts that we need to keep in mind and our solutions should respond to those. Action without strategy makes prioritizing resources and measuring progress difficult. We heard that from, from more than one of the communities. And that clarity in alignment between regional actions and local actions is just so important for moving the needle forward. And leveraging partnerships. This is a complex problem in front of us of housing affordability, and we need to make sure that we engage many, many different stakeholders in the solutions. And the last thing that, that we noted that we learned from these, these interviews was that sustaining programming and implementation after the plan is critical to think about even from the beginning. So don't just launch into a study, but have an idea of how you're going to be using that information to move forward. So after that, we tried to craft kind of um, a concise list of the reasons why, reasons why a regional approach is so important. 
and of course at Dr. Cog with our long legacy of data-driven approaches, we knew that was critically important and a role that Dr. Cog could play. We also knew how important it is to draw on our local government partners and other partners in coming together to address housing. We had already been doing this, but even more so, integrating housing into our other regional planning work was another benefit. And one of the things we heard from local governments over and over again was that if we can work on this together, we have greater leverage power in attracting funding to this issue. And of course, we always at Dr. Cog have our local governments front and front and center, and that assisting and supporting local governments in their efforts is a, a big benefit to this work. So you've seen this slide before as well. We started with the end in mind. We plan to integrate this work into our regional planning work. So in the end, we will integrate the regional housing uh, needs assessment and then what we'll embark on in December, our regional housing strategy, ultimately into um, the next update to Metro Vision and our regional transportation plan. So we also took some time with all of you and other stakeholders to really define, so what's our purpose in this assessment? And as I mentioned before, front and center is this helps us further the, our, our vision that's articulated in Metro Vision, that we can really drive a data-informed and equity-centered approach, and that it's important that we can start and continue to foster a culture of shared responsibility. This is a tremendous challenge and all of our communities are experiencing the challenge of housing need at some level. And so the more that we can come together to work together is critical. And building consensus, not just for a vision, but for actions is where we wanna take this. And increasing the capacity of our local governments will not only help that local community, it'll really help all of us if we're focused on all of us moving forward together. And it's always front and center to build a region that is more resilient, inclusive, and equitable. So we organized our assessment into two key areas. First, we wanted to understand what is the scale and scope of housing need in our region from a data perspective. And then the second piece was we wanted to understand more deeply what are those barriers that are getting in the way of addressing housing need. So we engaged over 200 stakeholders. This slide represents all the different sectors from um, climate and sustainability groups to housing finance professionals. In addition, we formed a 25 plus member advisory group to walk through this from the very beginning and they provided tremendous guidance not just in the, uh, analyzing the, the data that, that, we, that we developed, but also helping us with process and connecting us to stakeholders. So our key findings, it's, it's a tremendous report, and I don't mean to say there's only four bullets here and there's only four findings, but you know, I didn't wanna talk for hours and hours tonight. So um, four key findings are first that we, um, w while we have seen um, a, a development pace currently that seems to be reasonable, we are still operating from a point of underproduction during a downturn around 20, 2008 to 2010. And so we, we know that um, while there's need for housing across all income levels, low-income households represent the greatest need for housing in our region. And that with the changing demographics in our region, that we're seeing a trend towards smaller households and a greater proportion of our population being over 65, we will need more diverse housing options. And lastly, one of the things we found is that housing types and affordability are unevenly distributed across our region. So during the barriers analysis, we heard a many, many different barriers. And these barriers were wide ranging. Um, they were experienced differently in different communities. They were also dynamic and had a sense of at times impacting each other. So we took all that we heard and we organized it into five key areas. And this slide represents the five key barriers that we found. So the last thing we did with our advisory group after hearing from so many different stakeholders is we asked them to help us define guiding principles that we can carry forward into our next phase of work, which is our regional housing strategy. 
And so they helped us define seven principles that we plan to carry forward into that work. I won't go through all of them, but certainly the importance of leading with an equity lens was brought up, that sticking to Dr. Cog's um, approach almost all the time of having a data-informed approach is important, and that while we need to be comprehensive, we also need to be flexible because there are different contexts in every community. So, we, that is where we were, what we did, and now where we're headed. And so you have a motion before you to accept the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. Questions, comments, from members? Uh, Director Levy. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, let's see, this is my fourth year on this board, and if I didn't sit next to Austin, <laughs> Director Ward, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> maybe it'd be a good thing if I didn't. Um, no, uh, thank you. Um, uh, and I, I love the work you've done, and uh, and I think all of our communities are, are really going to find it very interesting and very, very helpful in our own planning. And I, I, I guess I'm struck by... Um, you know, accepting it as a guide for Dr. Cog's future housing planning strategy and action. And uh, what I'm really, really eager to get to is how do we take this work and do that integration with transportation, which is, you know, the holy grail that a metropolitan planning organization and council of governments is really, you know, trying to get to per congressional direction. So. Um, do you hand this off then to transportation planning? Do, is this going to be a platform for doing more integrated work? Could you just speak to what comes next? Sure. Yeah, already what we're looking at is having this work in, uh, really advise a number of different avenues of work that we already do. So we have learned a lot through this assessment and working alongside our consultants. We plan to think about that as we are preparing future forecasts. And so that, and those forecasts also inform our transportation work. We also plan to, um, in our next update to MetroVision, but also the regional trans transportation plan, as we walk, take this data forward and walk through our housing strategy, we hope some of those strategies will advise those two, two um, planning efforts. And specifically, I'll just speak to what's in the housing strategy um, uh, scope of work that we put out there, we do. We are asking consultants to help us understand that that alignment and integration with transportation investment. Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. That that's helpful. Um, I had another question that's sort of uh, in a different direction, and I'm happy to wait and let other people go first. Um, you know, the the benefit of regional needs assessment um, totally understood. Uh, we're a very large region, though, and I and I I could see some value in some sub-regional assessments and strategies. Um, you know, just taking Boulder County as an example, uh, we know that in the in the county as a whole, a lot of our workforce commutes in from Adams County, Larimer County, even Weld County, and so understanding maybe on a um, you know, a, a sub-regional basis where the needs are and, and um, you know, what housing types uh, would be needed, I think would be really helpful for all of us. It's a great point. And it's something that we've considered even in the development of our uh, regional housing strategy. We have planted a seed for our consultants that perhaps they look at our sub-regional forums or other uh, smaller convening, smaller than the, the entire region, in order to dive deeper into the needs in those communities. Director Kondo, I'm sorry, Executive Director Rex, then we'll go to Director Kondo and then Director Douglas. Great, thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to chime in on that point. I, quite frankly, Director, I, I appreciate you so much. You're so thoughtful about this stuff. And quite frankly, this is, this is something that we envision as well regarding the, the utilization of our sub-regional forms in some degree to get into that strategy discussion, right? Because with an understanding, to your point, that parts of the region are different, right? They have their, 
the barriers are different in, in some parts of a region that might not exist in others, right? So um, I think, you know, as we really dive deep into the strategy work now, what I appreciate about what this needs assessment is, and one, the, the trust that you had for us to do this was that it's, it, was an, it was an assessment of need. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an allocation of need. We're yet to have those conversations, right? And we believe those conversations are better held by you all in those sub-regional type of forums. And hopefully there's a spot for us to help facilitate those conversations. But we, you know, we really believe that you know, we're, we're trying to provide you as many tools as we can for you all to have those conversations. Thank you. Director Kondo and then Director Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, on that point, I was, I was just sitting here thinking about this. I mean, uh, oh, is, is there a roadshow that we have to do possibly with our state legislators or the governor's office, that sort of thing? We may not have the answer, but I think it's important that they know that we're doing the assessment and we're doing it as a, as a, you know, on a scientific sort of matter using data as opposed to just kind of throwing things on the wall and seeing if it'll stick. Director Douglas. Well, actually, that was a question. Are, oh, do, okay. Are we, <laughs> did I ask? Okay. Yeah, sure. Actually, I do have two um, Really, really great idea because I think there's a lot of rich information, and because we're the largest region in the state, it seems like it would be very a, a great advisement to many different policymakers. One thing I want to mention, and this gives me a good segue, so thank you, is that um, one of the uh, bills that passed last, last spring, Senate Bill 174, which is a, a new law around housing assessment and housing planning, um, our staff has been having many discussions with DOLA and actually had a discussion today. We got to meet with their consultant to talk through what they're thinking about and how do we ensure that this great work gets carried forward and that we all have the same goal here. I mean, the state legislators that said, hey, we need to spend more time planning or assessing and planning for housing. Um, and so we are, we're working through that and we are very committed at Dr. Cog to make sure that this assessment gets, um, I'm gonna get the terminology from the bill incorrect, but um, gets through the first round of, of acceptance as, a, as an assessment. And I'm pretty confident after talking to staff that I think we're on a good path to do that. The reason being is that local governments can lean on regional assessments. So if a local government does not want to do or cannot do or has a reason for not carrying forward with their own local assessment, they can lean on regional assessments. And that's why it's so important and why we're committed to making sure that this assessment we've completed really is a benefit and, and, a, and a resource for all of you. And then one follow-up, if you indulge me, uh, Mr. Chair. So I'm curious, on slide 12, did, did um, the shortage of trade skills and or workforce development, was that ever discussed as a potential barrier to this solution? It, it did come up in our discussions. I'm just getting back to that screen. Yes, it did come up in those discussions. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to get all that we heard into these discrete categories, but I think what's, what's represented there is development costs and market factors that um, lack of a skilled workforce is contributing to those, so yes. All right, now Director Douglas. Thank you, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, I wasn't on the city council last year when you guys did this presentation or presented to Dr. Cog, uh, but I, I, I do, uh, I can see that you, your group has done some really good work. But one thing that's missing that I see because Commerce City along our corridor when it comes to transportation, multimodal, uh, we have um, the light rail, our commuter. But what's happening is they're building a lot of apartments and people want to downsize, but they also don't want to lose their investment. So basically, if they sell a home, they want to purchase a town home or a condo. They do not want to move into an apartment and see their their um, savings dwindle because of high rise and uh, apartment rental fees are, are, are cost. So this infrastructure, is this for metal housing as well? 
townhomes, condos, that sell, because this really pushes the rental market. Thank you, Director Douglas. That's a great question. And our assessment looked at housing need, and it looked at housing need um, also based on um, income, different income levels. And ye yes, we need a lot more different types, especially when we look at the demographics, as I mentioned, smaller households that may not want to have housing types that we have now, may want smaller um, units or condo units. So yes, it did include that. And I think when we get into the regional housing strategy, that is where we will dive deeper into that topic. Okay, thank you. Director Maurer. Thank you, Ms. Lynch, for your presentation. Um, last night we were discussing the very same thing about these assessments and City of Centennial recently completed their housing study after three years and we had a very sad sigh because we will not meet the requirement that we um, pass this recent legislature. So yes, we will be leaning on this study. Um, but my question is, is um, so some of the strategies that we developed were ADUs, which I'm thinking that'll probably be one of going forward here. What about land banking? That's a great strategy. And I hope that's a big piece of, of our housing strategy. I think with our housing strategy, one of the things that we are we realize is that we are not leaving anything out at this point, and we certainly want to hear from our local governments and other stakeholders to understand what needs to be a part of it and what makes the most sense for our region. Director Paul. Great. I just want to thank the Dr. Cog staff. This has been very helpful to Denver and really helped craft the uh, ballot initiative that's going before the voters in a couple of weeks to look at an affordable housing tax. And I think this information will be great to help us move forward if it is passed on how we start to implement the different strategies that are key to it. Thank you very much. It's been a great document already in its early days. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. Okay, Director I got Spears. it. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I would love to uh, move that the Board of Directors of Denver Regional Council of Governments accepts the Regional Housing Needs Assessment as a guide for Dr. Cog's future housing planning strategy and action. Second. I'm sorry, who was the second? Uh, excellent. Uh, Director Paul gave the second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, that motion does carry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Your um, plan is, is adopted or approved. All right. Next up on our agenda, discussion of revisions to Dr. Cog's committee, committee policy guidelines and descriptions a document to establish oversight of Dr. Cog's building decarbonization program. Uh, Robert Spots, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations will be presenting. Good evening, Mr. Spots. All right, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me again. Oh, no. Um, we, I pressed the wrong button, sorry. Uh, we, we came to you last month uh, to describe the new committee um, structure we're proposing to uh, oversee and um, make decisions regarding the decarbonized Dr. Cog program. That is the $200 million building decarbonization program that was awarded today through EPA. So that award today has started our five-year clock to execute this program. So we're hoping to get these, pro these uh, committees stood up as quickly as possible. So 
Um, I, I don't want to go through everything that we went through last um, month, but just to show you what we've done is we basically, this document, I'm sorry, I'm giving everybody, <laughs> let me just stop here and say, this is our committee policy guidelines and descriptions document. This is the document that describes the roles and um, membership decision-making abilities of our various committees, including TAC, RTC, the Area and Agency Advisory Board. So basically what we've done is tacked on two really cool new committees at the end of this thing, and I'm gonna get there. Yikes. There we are, red line stuff. So there are two new committees here. So the first one I'll just briefly remind you about is the what we're now calling the Regional Building Decarbonization Carbonization Oversight Committee, or probably OC for short. Um, and again, that's four Dr. Cog board members. We're hoping to select those Dr. Cog board members uh, after this, uh, assuming you uh, adopt these changes. Folks from the Colorado Energy Office, utilities, and then three special interest seats. So much like RTC, this um, committee will um, approve and recommend um, decisions to the Dr. Cog board, who will make the final decisions. Um, uh, anything else that's critical here? Um, one thing to note is that the um, chair and um, vice chair will be those Dr. Cog board members, two of those four Dr. Cog board members, and it, uh, the, the chair in particular will have a critical role in assigning or designating upon recommendation the special interest and utility seats. Um, the transfer or the technical committee, there's a TC has uh, a much larger uh, group of senior level staff from around the region, including local government representatives from each county, um, as well as, uh, again, the energy office, utilities, and eight representatives of special interest seats, including um, those that serve low income and disadvantaged communities as a primary audience. Again, those special interest seats would be assigned by the um, chair of the oversight committee. I'm happy to review any of this in more detail. Otherwise, this is um, this is very similar to what we went over with you all last month. No, no significant changes. Um, to kind of just put it into the format where you all can adopt this into um, bylaws. Questions? Yes, Director Mornis. Um, I see in this document that Exxon Energy is listed quite often. Uh, we have in our area, United Power is a big distributor. Um, so is that going to be included in here as well? They, they can be. There's, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to get a couple of special utility seats on both committees. So we'd love to have them if they're willing to participate in the process. But we did also recommend that the terms are one year for these positions. So, you know, we could rotate through the various committees if they're not receiving the appropriate representation over time. I had the same question about core energy. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So, uh, Chair will entertain a motion. Chair, I'd move to approve the amendments to Dr. Cog's committee policy guidelines and descriptions to add two standing committees to oversee and advise the regional building decarbonization program. Director Barr, thank you. A second. Second. We had multiple seconds. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, that motion carries. Thank you very much. Yeah. Carry on here. Yep. All right, great. So we're going to move straight into selecting those four members. Um, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Doug and our chair for this one. Well, thank you very much, Robert. And listen again, thank you for all your work, sir. On, uh, on attaining this, uh, obtaining this grant and all the work you will do in the future associated with this program. Lord knows we're only getting started, aren't we, buddy? <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there. Um, so this evening, um, 
as we mentioned to you at the last meeting, we um, we don't want to lose any time in, in establishing these committees. So um, we wanted to roll right into accepting nominations for and uh, approval of appointments to serve on the oversight committee. Um, and I know we had we sent out a solicitation and we received seven names that are interested in in uh, in participating on this. I would tell you, as Robert had mentioned, there are four voting seats available as well as up to four alternate positions so i want to let everybody know if they're if they so desire and we hope you are that um if you're not in it selected as one of the top four you can still participate on that committee of course you just can't be the voting member so it's kind of a similar uh, situation of like what we do with our regional transportation committee right members and alternates are are welcome to attend those meetings, participate in the conversations, but when it comes to the vote, only the members can cast those votes, okay? So um, so we're anticipating, Mr. Chairman, to do a uh, secret ballot, seeing we have more, we have more spots, or I'm sorry, more, more interest than spots available. Um, and I'm gonna turn to the chair, one, that we, of course, you know, would offer um, nominations from the floor if there's interest. Definitely, I, we do have a ballot and here's the thing, we didn't, we weren't able to put together a, a bio of each of these folks to send out ahead of time. So what I'd like to do is for the folks, uh, before we, we accept any nominations from the floor, what I'd like to do, and, and uh, Ms. Stevens is handing out the ballots right now, what I'd like to do is go by however they're, they're on the ballot and ask you to give us a couple minutes of why you want to be on this committee um, the community you serve, why you want to be on the committee, and anything else that you think um, this body needs to know in order to um, cast these votes. So we'll start with Director Stephen Barr from Littleton. Thank you, Chair. Um, is it, oh, that is coming through now. Um, thanks, everyone, for the time. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm I'm just so excited about this program, um, and I know Doug has seen my enthusiasm through our meetings and whatnot as we've explored these opportunities. And um, just to give a little bit of background myself, I'm Mayor Pro Tem for the city of Littleton. Uh, my day job is actually managing multiple EPA grant programs in the staff there. And so I, my day to day is compliance, contracting, procurement, and managing technical work, working with disadvantaged communities uh, across the country. Um, and that's kind of been my job, you know, for the past about 10, 12 years now. Um, so I'm very familiar with the rules and regulations and how to launch programs kind of like this. I mean, quite frankly, not to this size, um, pretty effectively. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I don't have, I don't, I'm not bringing a technical background of energy production, um, incentive packages and the like, but I'm very familiar with the players, especially in the South Metro region, um, the nonprofits, community organizations, workforce development programs um, that would be very natural partners in this program. So um, thanks for hearing me out. Thank you, Director Barr. Next up is Director Emily Baer from Erie. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I, I'm Emily Baer. I'm from Erie. Um, and I w was really excited about this opportunity. I have spent the last couple of years um, testifying at the AQCC, APCD, um, all, all of the regulatory agencies um, advocating for greenhouse gas emission reductions and those kinds of things. And um, uh, I also was really involved in the Environmental Justice Action Task Force, so I wasn't assigned to it. I just um, plugged in and really stayed um, involved there. I live in a disproportionately impacted community with, um, you know, impacted by oil and gas development. Um, and so recognizing um, disproportionately impacted communities as well as LIDAC is super important to me. I also um, have met twice this month actually with um, local business owners in Erie and was hearing about the struggles that they were having with um, decarbonizing their buildings and and thinking about ways that we can um, meet them and, and help them. And in particularly women business owners, women um, receive, you may know this, 2% uh, or less of venture capital. And so they're, they're already on a steep slope. Um, and when you factor in women of color, that, that slope gets a lot steeper. So um, equity is um, just a very important lens for me. So that's why I threw my name in the hat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Baer. 
Next up is Director Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Baker. Uh, yes, this is Steve Douglas. I'm the mayor of Commerce City and also sit on the board for United Power. And uh, that role, uh, not only we act as a public utility commissions for United Power, we also, we, we just moved away from a major um, energy supplier, which is Tri-State, and now we're in the home. You talk about decarbonization, so uh, Bill 10, we have a, a number of non non-renewables to make up our energy sleeves. Uh, in the city of Commerce City, very well um, know the makeup of our city, being underserved, uh, a lot of low income and disadvantaged communities that are very impacted by our industries, Suncor, uh, there's a, a bunch of other companies that are polluters and we need to decarbonate, to decarbonize uh, their outcome as far as future built out of our city, because they have a they play a major part uh, our health concerns in the southern portion of Commerce City. So serving on this decarbonization oversight committee would be a uh, great investment of my time being uh, being elected to this board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Douglas. Next up is Director Claire Levy, Boulder County. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess, you know, I'll start the way, you know, I think we all start, which is our, our passion for the issue of decarbonization and the sense of urgency that I, I hope we all have around the need for this. So I think we can take that as a given for all of us who are interested in serving on this committee. Um, I, I want to just talk about a little bit about the whole breadth of the of the project. And um, you know, there is the of course the decarbonization aspect of it, what the goal is and what it takes to achieve that goal. Uh, but as I was looking at the materials and actually our Boulder County staff, I'm really proud of the role that they played in actually putting the application together and, and uh, digging into it with them in preparation for the presentations here at Dr. Cog. The, the community engagement, um, the outreach to minority and disadvantaged communities is a really, really important aspect of this grant that we have. And that along with the opportunity for workforce development um, is just a tremendous opportunity that in addition to the benefits of decarbonization are going to serve us in many, many, many other ways. Uh, we will have an engaged and active community around an issue that may not have felt accessible and attainable to those communities before, and we will have a workforce as a result of this that is going to put us in a position to just continue to build on and, um, and, and replicate and expand the impact that this $199 million dollar grant is going to bring to us and um, and so I I guess what I want to share is that I appreciate all the aspects of this opportunity and I'm really excited to make sure that all of those aspects are really um, valued and um, and and brought forward um, in equal measure uh, I think um, the, the, you know, that's that's really the the bulk of what I would say. I guess the last thing is, um, I don't bring anything technical to this either. Um, I am an elected official. I'm an attorney. Um, I but I I hope that the other directors have seen in me over the course of my service on this board a person who asks questions, um, really tries to understand and dig into issues so that when I make a decision, um, I'm as informed as I can be and that I, and that I take reasoned positions. And I think how a person makes a decision is a really important consideration. So I, I hope the board will consider the, the way in which I show up here at Dr. Cog board meetings and the way in which I participate. Thank you, Director Levy. Next up is Director Kondo from North Glen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is a privilege to be on this list of fine people. Uh, clearly, you're going to hear a number of, of uh, different perspectives and expertise uh, in all of us. 
and uh, hopefully you'll take that in consideration when you think about uh, your selections tonight because you do want to have a diversity of viewpoints uh, in this very important committee as well as hopefully uh, a geographic diversity. Uh, my personal interest in this uh, really stems from interest in sustainability. Uh, here are the things that three reasons that I think I, I would be a good contributor to this group. First of all, I represent the city of North Glen, and um, North Glen has been a leader, quite honestly, in, in championing renewable energy and sustainability. Uh, we just opened our new net zero city hall, and so this is uh, hopefully going to be the first uh, or certified building, uh, municipal building in the state of Colorado. Also, uh, we as a city have a, one of our six priority action areas, environmental stewardship, which is uh, currently in our draft five-year strategic plan. Uh, in fact, I believe our sustainability coordinator, uh, Ms. Owens, played a significant role in working with Dr. Cog, I'm sure with other municipalities as well, as Dr. Levy mentioned, in making this application. So uh, given the fact that we, we provided some lift uh, to this activity, I, I certainly feel an obligation to be able to provide some oversight and um, participate in this. And then the last reason that I would like to offer for consideration is that I'm a former Navy nuclear officer, so I understand some aspects about power generation and distribution. And uh, again, hopefully that, that will uh, provide some diversity of thought and opinion on, on this very important board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Kondo. Next up, Director Nicole Spear from Boulder. Thank you, um, and apologies for being person number six, because uh, I feel like this is the point where everybody's eyes kind of start to glaze over <laughs> <laughs> these processes. So try to try to make it a little bit engaging. Uh, my name is Nicole Spear. I am the mayor pro tem for the city of Boulder. The city of Boulder was a key partner with Dr. Cog in acquiring this grant to grow workforce training, generate well-paying jobs, and drive innovation in the built sector across our region. And I put myself forward uh, because I'm committed to good governance and I'm uniquely good at building efficient and transparent processes and strong working relationships. These skills seemed really key for a committee that has never existed before. I have served on the Dr. Cog Board of Directors for almost three years. I'm vice chair of the Performance and Engagement Committee where I've served for three years. This year I chaired the nominating committee. I also serve on the Mile High Flood District Board of Directors, where I serve on the Audit, Audit and Finance Committee. Um, I will transition off that board uh, next month, freeing up some time. Um, I have a strong understanding of Dr. Cog's regional goals and organizational values, deep experience working on regional committees, and the knowledge of how we got here. I would be honored to represent our board in this new role and on this new committee, and I would welcome your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Director Spear. Next up is Director Brian Wong, City of Lafayette. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, now that I guess I'm the one that gets to bring up the rear, um, <laughs> as I'm so used to doing um, with my last name. So um, Brian Wong, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Lafayette. I think there are, um, as Director Levy mentioned, there are so many reasons that I think the commonality between all of us that are ready for the position. But I think what I bring to the table um, is, number one, Lafayette's the diversity of our of our population. And whenever we look at things through a lens of managing sustainability in, in relations to our, our population and what and the economic and social impact that that would have on our population, um, I think we do a very good job of balancing that, um, which I appreciate about our community. Um, professionally by trade, I'm in human resources, so it's all about taking facts and data and um, looking at the information provided and making the best decision forward. So that's kind of what I bring to the table. And so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Director Wong. Now, um, I think all of these candidates deserve our attention, but I will open up for nominations from the floor. We have two spaces to write in, but I guess we could, we could write on the back or, or whatever. Are there any nominations from the floor? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close and proceed with voting. So moved. All right. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to close nominations and proceed to voting. 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? Seeing none, we will proceed to voting. Now, here we, we have to give a, a little bit of instructions because we have some folks online. I did get a number of, of, of folks who requested to be remote tonight, and then there are some that, that um, just came in on remote. So I want to remind everyone that the proper procedure to do this is to request from the chair and or the executive director um, who will get it to me to attend a meeting in a, re in a virtual mode. Uh, because of this, we have little ballots. And so, Ms. Stevens, can you go over what you've instructed the folks that are online on how to vote? Uh, they have received a phone number to text, and they will remain anonymous with their choices. Correct. They either received it via email or they received it direct message through Zoom. Okay. So um, the procedure is we're going to vote. You're going to vote for four. Check four boxes on the ballot. At that point, when we're done voting, Ms. Stevens will collect those. Um, Executive Director Rex and she will retire to um, wherever you're going to to count the votes and uh, we'll go on to the informational item. When they're done counting and have a result, they'll come back in and report to the body as a whole. Okay, proceed to vote. My hat for <laughs> Thank you. Raise your hand. Yeah, you guys are doing mind. a single hauler on your ballot? You don't want to ballot? Ballot? I just thought it. Oh, yeah. oh, done by ordinance. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> I was like, sorry, I misheard. I was like, oh, Jesus. What are friends for, my friend? Oh, we can we can just do this. <laughs> yeah, no, I. <laughs> oh, okay. This is ranked choice choice voting. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> Is there anyone still voting? All right. If you're online, if you're remote, um, Ms. Stevens will be collecting your votes and counting those when she um, is off counting. And she'll be assisted by Mr. Spots too. It is, it was actually. All right, we're gonna move on to the informational briefings. First up is regional bus rapid transit update. We've got Jacob Rieger here. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by letting every, everyone know that the executive director and the board chair instructed me to take exactly as long with this presentation as it will take to tabulate ballots. So let's see how I do. <laughs> <clears throat> Just to level set a little bit on this presentation, um, you actually had this presentation as an informational item in your packet last month uh, with the intention that we would present it tonight. Uh, we've made some updates. In fact, there's a lot that's happened even in the last month, um, so I'll cover that tonight. Um, also, last month's meeting, you heard a presentation from CDOT on the Federal Boulevard bus rapid transit project, so while I will mention that here, uh, we won't go over that again since you heard it last month, um, but that is, of course, a very important project in the ecosystem of what we're talking about. 
Um, this item is really geared towards giving you a more broad and comprehensive update on efforts around bus rapid transit uh, within the Denver, within our region, within the greater Denver region, um, and how we're working together to advance um, these projects. So story begins here with the Flatiron Flyer back in 2016. Um, I think most folks are familiar with the Flatiron Flyer, so I don't need to describe it. I think the point here is that Flatiron Flyer was really the region's first kind of experience with bus rapid transit, and it included some of the elements that you look for in a bus, you know, literally in a bus rapid transit service, um, including some of the things listed here, um, the very frequent service, the kind of semi-dedicated lanes, um, the off-board fare collection, transit signal priority, these and many more are hallmarks of a bus rapid transit service. So that was back in 2016 when the Flatiron Flyer opened. And then um, in 2019, uh, the Regional Transportation District completed the Regional Bus Rapid Transit Feasibility Study, uh, which I know many of you are familiar with. It was a very comprehensive study, looked at all of the major corridors across the entire region, um, as you see on their map here, uh, something like 40 or 50 corridors, and really assessing the potential of these corridors and the priority of these corridors for um, suitability and eventual implementation of bus rapid transit. And at that time, eight priority corridors were identified. Um, this list is going to look very familiar because you're going to see a version of this list um, again in a slide or two. Um, but it was these eight corridors that the study kind of rec recommended uh, for moving forward first towards implementation. We then took the results of the regional bus rapid transit feasibility study and rolled that into our own planning effort back in 2019, 2020, and 2021 for the 2050 regional transportation plan, which we adopted in 20, April of 2021 and then updated in uh, 2022, and really kind of brought that work forward, brought it into our overall kind of long-range plan planning process, um, and ended up with this is what's in our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. We have identified 11 distinct bus rapid transit projects or corridors, and we have staged those corridors for implementation by our air quality and financial staging periods. Um, so five of these corridors by 2030, another five by 2040, all 11, and including a bus maintenance facility to support um, these corridors by 2050. So it's a very assertive kind of implementation schedule. Um, and I think this is a good slide to say that even just in the last month, uh, we've had a lot of progress. As Executive Director Rex mentioned, um, Colfax, East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit um, has now broken ground on construction. Uh, Colorado State Highway 119 Bus Rapid Transit Corridor has also broken ground on construction. We're one of the few regions, I think, right now that can brag that we have two BRT corridors under construction as we speak. Um, but two of the other near-term corridors, Federal Boulevard that you heard about last month and Colorado Boulevard are in the federal kind of project development, the formal project development process, the NEPA process. Um, and then the East Colfax Extension uh, Project, we are actually leading an alternatives analysis. We are just got a fully executed contract last week. We are about to kick off that project. So those are the first five bus rapid transit corridors that you see in the 2020 to 2030 staging period. So we're moving as a region, we're moving those corridors forward and starting to think about kind of the next tranche of corridors by 2040 and 2050. Um, so it's not just 11 BRT corridors, as important as that is. We're really building a regional transit network here, right? So when you think about our existing and future kind of light rail, um, commuter rail, inner city rail, bus rapid transit, mountain rail, bus staying, all of those things and more, it's really about building this interconnected, dedicated rapid transit network within and throughout um, the greater Denver region and even the greater Front Range region, right? So um, that's really the ultimate point here is to build that interconnected network to help people get uh, where they need to go. So uh, from transitioning from the network to the partnership, the BRT network and, and bus rapid transit is an important investment priority, as you've seen within our 2050 regional transportation plan. And it's important for many reasons, right? Safety, equity, mobility, multimodalism, air quality, greenhouse gas. It's actually one of our, one of several of our important greenhouse gas compliance strategies uh, within the 2050 regional transportation plan. In fact, when we amended our plan back in 2022 to first comply with the transportation greenhouse gas rule, one of our strategies was actually to 
um, accelerate the implementation of several of the bus rapid transit corridors as an important strategy to help us get there. And it's not just the work that we're doing together as a metropolitan planning organization, but um, within CDOT, within the city of Denver, and within other jurisdictions as applicable, you know, bus rapid transit is part of their plans as well, um, as it should be for a regional, regional sort of investment and a regional priority. So that's the network. Um, so because of, you know, because of all of that work, we formed the Regional Bus Rapid Transit Partnership, uh, which we describe as a multi-agency planning, funding, and implementation collaborative. Um, here, I want to um, recognize uh, Director Kondo, um, who asked me very astutely about that question mark. What do we mean by that question mark? So we believe, as far as we know, that this is pretty unique in the way that we're approaching this as a region. Uh, we believe that it's the only multi-agency, voluntary, collaborative partnership coming together to do this work, particularly in which multiple partners within the partnership are leading different corridors, different BRT corridors and projects, and yet all of the stakeholders and all of the agencies are working together on all of the corridors. There are certainly other regions, even in our part of the country, that are investing in bus rapid transit, and they may have formed some level of partnership, but we think ours is the most extensive and, and most unique. So as we've presented this at conferences, as we've had peer exchanges, as we've talked to the consultant community, we haven't heard something quite like what we're doing here. Um, so we're proud of that approach, um, but it's really about doing the work. And I think if you remember only one thing I say tonight, probably the most important point of this presentation is that speaking of the work, it's more work than any single agency can lead or do alone. All right, we need this partnership because as you saw on the previous slide, we have a very assertive and ambitious implementation schedule in the work that we're contemplating as a region to implement these bus rapid transit investments. The agencies really needed to come together and want to come together in this voluntary partnership um, to coordinate that work. So these are the members of the Bus Rapid Transit Partnership. These have been my new best friends for the past year and a half. Um, and I want to recognize the partners, right? This is a partnership. Um, we have worked together. We're meeting monthly, working very closely together. Um, we specifically sort of kept the partnership, and I say we, the royal we, kept this partnership sort of pretty tight um, to begin with, a focus on uh, primarily the, the big regional and kind of state agencies. FTA Region 8 has also participated in some of the meetings, but we're cognizant, and I want to make clear that as we continue to do this work and as we implement these bus rapid transit corridors, we've actually counted, and the 11 bus rapid transit corridors touch something like 20 plus individual jurisdictions within this region. So we're already working with individual jurisdictions and we will continue to do that as this partnership evolves and as the projects get implemented. So just a little bit about the partnership itself. Big picture, we're accelerating or we're the goal of accelerating project development and implementation for multiple BRT corridors simultaneously. And that's a little bit as well what sets our region apart. Uh, we're doing a lot of these corridors together. Lots of things are happening. We want to leverage resources. We want to find efficiencies. We want to build a consistent system across across the region. Nobody cares about individual lines or municipal jurisdictions. You get on a BRT, you want to feel like you're part of a system, and that's what we're working towards. Specifically, we've been working in the three areas that you see here, um, updating project costs, looking at innovative funding and financing mechanisms, um, thinking about design standards. You know, we always say, well, what is BRT, right? Well, we know it when we see it. Well, let's do better than that. Let's actually define what are those individual sort of elements and components of BRT um, that really make it bus rapid transit. And we're also thinking about, as I alluded to, the partnership itself. How do we grow and evolve? How do we grow and evolve over time to do this work and to work with our jurisdictions? Um, I'll talk about our Build America Bureau grant that Doug mentioned last month in a couple slides, but I think, you know, bottom line here is our approach, our philosophy is that we're building a regional network, right, and a system, not 11 individual BRT projects. So here's a table of a lot of words that I don't expect you to absorb or memorize, um, but the point here is we wanted to show the status of all 11 corridors, so I'm going to make two points about this table. One is that these 11 corridors are in very different stages. As I said earlier, some of them have broken ground for construction. Some of them are in planning and project development. Some of them are not much more than lines on a map in our long-range transportation plan. So part of the partnership's work is to sort of, you know, help these corridors along, help get these corridors to a consistent point. What can we learn from those that have come before us and those that are coming now and apply that to future corridors so that we're not reinventing the wheel, we're not, you know, redoing work 11 times over. 
Um, the other thing I'd point out here is the point about the partnership. If you look on the far right and you see the current lead agency, you will see the acronym soup of a lot of different agencies. And again, as I said, I think that's what makes this unique. CDOT is leading some of these corridors. City of Denver um, and Aurora have been leading a corridor. Um, we at Dr. Cog are leading a, a planning process for one of the corridors. Um, through our corridor studies, we've been doing some initial planning work, right? So this really is that true collaborative multi-agency partnership coming together. And again, all of these partners are involved in all of the corridors and to their benefit, I think. Um, so here, East Colfax um, Executive Director Rex mentioned this at the beginning of the meeting of the groundbreaking. Um, I do want to acknowledge he's a City of Denver slide, so I always feel a little weird presenting another agency slides. So I'm mostly not going to because the message is that this project has broken ground. It's under construction. The region is very excited about that. Um, but I will say, in, in fairness, the point of this slide is that um, this project is a good example of contextualizing the bus rapid transit project to the context of the community character of where this project is going to go. In this case, from downtown Denver Union Station to I-225 and the R line in Aurora, the different colors indicate the different design elements or the different cross sections of the BRT project um, that will be constructed as it goes through um, the entire corridor. Um, this gives you a sense of what it's going to look like. Again, I think the point here is that BRT is often described as rail on wheels, and I think you kind of see that, the dedicated transit way, the signature stations, some of the other design elements that really help um, BRT function as sort of that rapid, uh, frequent, convenient bus service, again, sort of like rail on wheels. Um, project schedule, it's broken ground, it's under construction, we're excited. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, <laughs> Um, another project, so again, last month you heard about federal BRT, federal boulevard BRT, so I'll take a moment to talk about Colorado State Highway 119 uh, bus rapid transit. Um, Gene Sanson from the city of Boulder, um, who represents the Colorado 119 corridor coalition on the regional BRT partnership, uh, wanted me to convey that, of course, the big news here is that this corridor is also under construction. Really excited about that. This corridor is somewhat unique for a couple reasons. One is that, as you can see on the map, a um, couple different route elements to it, um, but also that it's more than just bus rapid transit service. It's a bikeway, a uh, really extensive regional bikeway that it will include um, bus queue bypass lanes and other corridor improvements um, along with the bus service itself. Um, this project is also started to, um, excuse me, this project is also anticipated to start service in 2027. So finally, I'm going to end with, you know, just sort of what is our role. Um, and I want to say this with some humility because, again, it's a partnership. I want to recognize and appreciate those partners. Um, it is our natural role as a metropolitan planning organization to bring partners together um, to address regional issues. So I'm not going to read this off to you. There's a lot of things here. I do want to pull out a couple highlights. Uh, one is the importance of our regional transportation plan in defining officially these bus rapid transit corridors and the other transit corridor investments that are in the plan. That's something that the federal agencies look for as these projects go through to project development um, and ultimately funding. Um, we have also, as I alluded to, my colleague Nora Kern has been leading our new corridor planning program, which did a first steps visioning study on the Alameda corridor, which is a bus rapid transit corridor. Um, and as I said, we are about to kick off um, leading the alternatives analysis for the East Colfax extension um, project that will extend the East Colfax bus rapid transit from I-225 at the R line um, out to approximately E-470. And then finally, as Executive Director Rex um, announced at our um, at your meeting last month, uh, we had just learned then that we won a grant from the U.S. DOT Build America Bureau, almost a million dollar grant that will help um, us and the region and the partnership advance the planning and the pre-construction for those next tranche of BRT corridors um, that are next in the pipeline in the plan. Um, oh, and there it is, actually. I didn't realize we had the slide, so I just kind of said that, um, but just really briefly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, um, didn't realize it. I'd uh, forgotten that the slide was in here. So we want a grant. Uh, we're really excited about that. Really going to allow us to bring a lot of uh, resources and bring partners together um, on this work. Um, again, we will procure, procure expert advisors. That's the Build America Bureau language in English. That means consultants uh, with expertise in some of the fields that I talked about during the presentation, updating project costs, innovative funding and financing. 
um, some legal and regulatory work if we're interested in like value capture, tax increment financing, other creative mechanisms. How do we do that? Who, who does that? What's allowed under Colorado state law? All those sorts of things. So really, it's going to allow us to identify and deploy pre-construction activities, again, to accelerate that next tranche of corridors to help move them forward um, to get them ready for, um, get them ready for construction. So this is an ongoing conversation. We'll come back every few months to update you on the great work that the partners are doing. Um, but we wanted to give you this update, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Director Kondo. I didn't have any questions, actually. <laughs> oh. That's okay. I just saw the name tag up. In, at CCI, at Colorado County is incorporated. That's the signal that you want to speak. You turn your name tag up. Other questions, comments? Yes. I know that. I do every day. <laughs> We're going to go online to Mayor Douglas first. Director Douglas. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, this looks... This a bus rapid transit is is great on the front range. What is the discussion for coming east, you know, the airport, including um, Brighton, you know, Commerce City? We are so close to the airport, but we trying to make sure we take as many cars off the road, get people on buses going to the airport. How, how, what's the process of, of uh, doing the bus rapid transit? Jacob? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that question because it is a very important issue. Um, I, I think first the distinction I'd make is that there are many types or flavors of bus service. Um, bus rapid transit, as we've talked about tonight, is certainly um, an important one for sure, but there are other types of sort of frequent bus service, limited bus service. You know, there's different options for doing different things. In fact, our regional transportation plan recognizes sort of different levels and different types of investment in bus-based sort of multimodal um, transit investments within the plan. So, you know, there's that sort of general comment that there are many ways to sort of get at that very important issue um, that Director Douglas raises. Um, in particular, though, I will mention that, as I said, we're about to kick off an alternatives analysis for the East Colfax extension out to E-470. While that is not the airport, we have already started preliminary conversations um, around some of those issues and heard from the airport, from um, the planning staff and others sort of in that region. There's a lot going on um, between the city of Aurora, the Aerotropolis, um, the airport itself. And so this project probably can't address all of those issues, um, but it is something that we'll be cognizant of um, as we work on that project and these other projects in particular. Thank you. Director Levy. No? Okay, I'm sorry. You, you were pointing at Director Ward and Director Peck. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I guess I just have one question and maybe one, one comment, depending on how I feel. Um, I, obviously, the presentation, as there were eight that were prioritized after the 2019 study, and then we have 11 that have been put in the overall plan out to 20, um, 2050. I, I would hope that nothing precludes the addition of new BRT lines, because going back to like the 2014 NAM study, the Northwest Area Mobility Study completed by RTD, um, there were other lines that were identified um, as potential BRT corridors like 120th Avenue between Thornton and Broomfield, um, State Highway 7, which obviously we are continuing to move forward with between Bowler, Lafayette, Brighton, Broomfield, Thornton, et cetera. Um, so can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, thank you, Director Warden. Um, so as one example, in our new corridor planning program, you know, one corridor that we did was Alameda that I mentioned, but the other corridor that we worked on was the South Boulder Road corridor, which is one of those NAMS corridors. Um, I participate in the NAMS work um, way back when. It's, it's something that is close to us. We understand the importance of it. So I think to directly answer your question, um, Director Ward, we are about to embark on a major update to our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, and that will involve a, um, a whole set of things that we'll be doing as part of the plan. And one of those tasks will be um, at least some level of uh, sort of opening up or revisiting to a certain extent um, the bus rapid transit network within the plan. 
I say that with some caution because we're already taking on 11 corridors. That's a lot. Um, how many more BRT corridors can the region, you know, literally undertake? Um, but we don't want to preclude the opportunity to have some thoughtful conversation around some potential revisions or refinements to um, the bus rapid transit network. And again, as I said to Director Douglas's question as well, you know, BRT sort of feels like, I don't want to say flavor of the month because that gives it short shrift, but, you know, we focus on BRT, we focus on rail, um, but let us not forget that there is a whole compendium, um, there's a whole spectrum of sort of bus-based investments and what does that look like. In fact, under federal law, BRT actually has some definitions um, that can sometimes be helpful, but sometimes maybe there's bus service out there that would meet some of those, but not all of those, but would still be a really frequent, fast um, important um, sort of bus service. So I think the point is that, yes, an opportunity to rethink it, but also some thoughtfulness around what exactly is really needed within a given location, what does that look like, and how do we work together to implement it? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I won't have my comment. I can live without it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Director Peck. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. This is really exciting about all these BRT uh, buses. But my question is, you are working with RTD. Um, is there a strategic plan to be able to actually purchase the buses to service these in the timeline that the uh, projects will be complete? Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Peck. That's a really good question. Short answer is yes, but a, a tiny bit longer answer is that there are so many things, the sort of interoperability that goes into these bus rapid transit projects, um, the maintenance, the operations, the vehicle procurement. I mean, there's so many things, and what you mentioned is certainly one of those very important ones. And so the partners in the region is being thoughtful. We'll use the example that is federal BRT is coming forward, as you heard CDOT talk about last month. You know, they're looking to what um, is being done on East Colfax. Um, as Colorado BRT moves forward, they're looking at uh, what you know what's being done on Federal Boulevard. So again, not wanting to reinvent the wheel 11 times over, the short answer is again, yes, that we are being thoughtful around things like vehicle procurement and where can we standardize the fleet, where can we save dollars, um, where do these vehicles come from, who operates them, all of that is part of the calculus. Okay, thank you. Director Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do like this way of uh, raising our hands, by the way. I'm gonna do that going forward. Um, I just want to add on to uh, some of the comments that uh, Director Ward put out. And I'm, every time BRT comes up, I'm probably the pain in the ass in the room. But um, stay at Highway 7, that, that was just mentioned, that would serve between, um, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just name the communities, Brighton, Thornton, Erie, Broomfield, Lafayette, Boulder. So if you look up what it takes to get between uh, Brighton and Boulder if you want to take transit. It takes three hours for a 40-minute drive. I can drive to Kansas in that time frame. Um, moving BRT priority levels up to include Highway 7 would be important because there is no other direct transit service, and, and we all pay the same 1% into RTD. All of our communities, maybe, except, maybe parts of Erie don't, but the majority of us do, and we're not getting the true benefit of that 1% that we're paying into RTD. So including this would actually help benefit having more ridership going between those communities. And we all have, we all have people that live and work in all those communities. So I would highly encourage us to have this in the priority list. There, there's a Highway 7 coalition that meets quarterly, and we talk about trying to get prepared for the future of BRT, and we want to do it before before I have to, you know, get a Medicare card. <laughs> Jacob, would you like a response to that, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I can top that, but um, yes, we've had this continuing dialogue. I think you know what, what I'm going to say, but I will say it. Um, so look, I hear you. I appreciate those concerns. Um, is better transit service needed from Boulder to Brighton? Absolutely. Does that transit service, should it be BRT? Can it be BRT? I think that's to be determined. Um, again, BRT actually means very specific things 
It means specific things from a federal definition. It means very specific things in terms of how it's designed, how it's operated, the supporting land uses. There's so much that goes into sort of that designation of BRT. So again, you've heard us say it before, I will remind you respectfully that yes, that corridor is in our 2050 regional transportation plan, hundreds of millions of dollars in our fiscally constrained plan to help develop that project. We call it a transit planning corridor to help move that corridor forward to really um, to really solidify what the ultimate vision is for the corridor project or projects for such a long corridor, moving those investments forward. So it is in our plan. I think the ongoing dialogue is, you know, what does it ultimately look like? Does it fit under the BRT banner? Or what is the most appropriate investment for better transit service between your communities? Director Levy. Thank you. I want to thank Director Mills for um, reminding us all of um, that corridor and how important it is. And um, I believe, it, yes, it is on the 2050 um, transportation plan. Um, I, uh, starter BRT service is in the tip, um, in the 2024 27 tip, I believe. I know we discussed this at our Boulder subcommunity forum, and um, and I and I think we did put it on our list. So I'm fairly certain we've got some funding for that starter service in there, and that's sort of a pilot to test and see what the ridership looks like. And um, I know when we discussed it at our sub-regional forum, um, you know, many of us were concerned that the starter service may not actually demonstrate much success given that we don't have the improvements in that corridor to actually support that. Um, Cause I've seen what, what Colorado seven looks like um, both into and out of Boulder. And so, you know, we do need to look at real targeted improvements to make that work. Oh, don't get me started on improvements. That was another fight with CDOT last week. But yeah. Another discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Peck. I, I want to throw my support behind that as well. I know that for 10 years, Colorado uh, Highway 7 has been a topic of conversation and that the same reasons that have become excuses are uh, being aired. So um, yes, we need to discuss that in the, the TIP process. Um, and I, I totally throw my support behind that. That was my real question about RTD. Are we going to even have those buses? So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Director Harmon. On? Oh, I am. Okay, great. I know that there are obviously limited resources anytime we're looking at a project like this. In a phase two of any of these um, options, will you be during a micro transit for even fixed route circulators that are focused on large employment centers? Make sure we can close the gap of that last mile. Yeah, thank you, Director. That's an important question. So again, short answer is yes. Um, slightly longer answer is that both with bus rapid transit planning, but even separate from bus rapid transit planning, micro transit has become an increasing focus. Um, we actually have a um, uh, transportation improvement program sort of set aside um, uh, funding opportunity out right now. Um, and there have been some recent funding for both from us and from RTD and others for um, a lot of micro transit pilots or micro transit studies, um, particularly up in Adams County. So yes, I think the short answer is yes on micro transit. And I think the philosophical answer is that Bus rapid transit is certainly important, but any transit project, whether it's rail or bus rapid transit or anything else, really sort of adds value in terms of how it connects people to where they need to go. And so those first last mile connections, those opportunities that micro transit serves um, in terms of being able to bring people from their homes to the transit station is critically important. So that is not forgotten as we go forward in this work. Other questions, comments? Thank you much, Mr. Rieger. Thank you. With the uh, board's uh, concurrence, I'll go ahead and, and uh, list the results of the election. First of all, I want to say it was a very smooth election. There was no foreign government interference. <laughs> <laughs> there was no hanging chads. And so in alphabetical order, the four that were selected as, um, as directors, members, um, are Stephen Barr, Stephen Douglas, Rich Condo, and Brian Wong. 
The other members are uh, appointed as alternates and will serve as that as we develop those uh, such details as when the meetings will take place and how often and things like that, we'll get the, you that information. Uh, did Mr. Spots have anything to add to that? I just wanted to, no? Okay. Thank you all very much. Great. So again, the winners are Stephen Barr, Steve Douglas, Rich Condo, and Brian Wong. I didn't get the numbers, I just got the names. So there's anybody that wants to audit those, those numbers will we'll meet you in the back. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the next informational briefing. This point, is, point of order. Do yeah. we have to move to accept those? I think you're right. I think that would probably be the, the next item on the agenda. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, any, any further discussion before I ask for a motion? Director Sherazai. I just, it's worth noting, it's four men, so a little bit of lack of diversity there. And We noted that, yeah. So, thought that, that would be important to say for the record. Yeah, thank you. Is there a motion to approve these nominations as being the members of the RBDOC and RBD, is o R R R OC and TC? Just OC. Just OC? That's right, this is just OC. So moved. We have a motion, second, multiple seconds, thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? One opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. We appreciate everyone who expressed interest in that. Moving on to the next informational briefing. This is the public engagement plan update, um, uh, attachment F in your packet. We're gonna hear from Kelsey Fofar Jones, public engagement planner. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. I'm Kelsey Forfar Jones, the public engagement planner here at Dr. Cog, um, and I am leading the update to the public engagement plan. Um, this is just informational. I wanted to share with you all um, what we've done so far, where we're at in the process, and where we're headed. Um, we're about halfway through the process, uh, so I'm just going to share that with you. Um, just for a quick refresher um, of what the public engagement plan is um, for the public, this is a great resource for understanding um, Dr. Cog's engagement and planning processes, uh, as well as the best ways to involve or get involved with Dr. Cog. Uh, it's also a, a great document um, with information around Dr. Cog's public engagement philosophy. Um, and so um, that, that includes um, information, um, around um, how often we do engagement uh, and the when, where, why, and how Dr. Cog does engagement. There's also information on the best ways to get involved if someone wants to know um, how to, um, to um, sorry, <laughs> um, to provide um, their feedback to us, uh, then the plan will have information around that. And then uh, there's information around Dr. Cog's policy process. Uh, and so for everyone in this room, how um, that policy process works might be a given, but not necessarily for the public. So there's more information um, regarding that for anyone who's interested. The plan is also a great uh, resource for staff. Um, and outlines uh, information regarding Dr. Cog policy, um, more specifically our public engagement principles, uh, which guide all of our public engagement here at Dr. Cog. Uh, there's also information around legal requirements. Some plans have uh, specific engagement requirements such as public hearings and public comment periods. And so um, 
steps for that uh, will be available or are available in the plan. And then finally, strategies and tips for success. Uh, there's a lot of information on tools, techniques, uh, potential partnerships, uh, those sorts of things uh, available in the plan for staff to use when um, thinking about uh, starting engagement for a project or for improving engagement. So uh, just going over our engagement principles, um, like I mentioned, these are um, the guide for engagement here at Dr. Cog, uh, and so I wanted to share them all with you. Um, early and ongoing engagement, timely and adequate notice of when we're um, asking for uh, the public to engage with us, consistent access to necessary and um, useful information, public review and comment on plans, consideration of perspectives from disadvantaged communities, and regular review of the public engagement process. So why are we updating the plan? Um, for one, it is one of our um, uh, guiding principles. Um, but more than that, uh, the plan hasn't been updated since 2019. Um, and a lot has changed since then, both here at Dr. Cog and just generally. So wanting to capture that. Uh, it is within the UPWP to update the plan this year. So complying with that. And then finally, um, we're always striving to make Dr. Cog's engagement uh, better and to expand our reach. So what exactly is changing in the plan? Um, there will be information, new information on virtual engagement strategies, uh, piloted innovative public engagement strategies, techniques and requirements for regional planners and AAA staff, and revisions to make the document more readable and usable. Um, and jumping into that first one, uh, virtual public engagement strategies. Um, like I mentioned, the plan hasn't been updated since 2019, and so that doesn't really take into consideration um, the COVID pandemic, and engagement has really changed since then. Uh, although we can now do in-person engagement again, we found that the best way to capture um, all voices is by doing both virtual and in-person. Um, so we have some new strategies that we use, um, including virtual public meetings and um, our social pinpoint site, which is really our hub for uh, all of our projects that include um, public engagement or have public facing information. Uh, and if any of you haven't checked out our social pinpoint site yet, I highly recommend you do. We've got a lot of great information in there. Um, it's also a great place to see what um, the public is uh, saying in response to some of our projects. We have um, public comments up there. Um, and then moving on to the second, piloted innovative public engagement strategies. Uh, our sub-area planning team has been piloting quite a few public engagement strategies that we'd like to include in the plan. Uh, some of those are compensation for focus groups, uh, food at public meetings, and transit passes for attendees. Uh, and not only do we want to include these strategies, but include some of the lessons learned from those pilots. Then techniques and requirements for RPD and AAA. The plan currently has a lot of information on transportation planning, but uh, Dr. Cog does uh, more than just transportation. Um, so we want to ensure that the plan encompasses all of that and can be a resource for our regional planning staff as well as our AAA staff. And so uh, the update will have some information um, on the engagement requirements for those staff, as well as uh, best techniques and strategies. So the plan for this project, like I mentioned, we're about halfway through. Uh, we've been developing the document since June, and we anticipate um, finishing that up around the end of this month, uh, and then having a final document done by mid-March. Um, and ready for approval by our board and committees. So where we're at now and next steps, uh, we just went through some workshops with key staff 
to understand how staff are currently using the plan and what would make it a better resource uh, for staff when leading engagement. So we will want to incorporate that feedback into the document. Um, we've also been hosting some meetings with some of our regional partners to understand how they're doing engagement and thinking about engagement to ensure that we're keeping up with that um, and engaging the best we can. Um, and then after we're done with document development, we will have a draft for staff to review. Uh, we'll do some revisions and then we'll have our public review, um, do some more revisions, and then um, we'll have our, our final document. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time and happy to answer any questions. Questions? Director Kondo. Hello. Okay. Uh, question. I <clears throat> I wonder, do you collaborate with the various cities in terms of their plan, their you know recreation or events departments, so that you have a kind of a master calendar of some of the events, whether it's Broomfield Days or uh, Brighton's Car Derby or North Glen's Par Parrot Festival, that sort of thing. It, it seems to me that if you really want to reach the public and get a whole bunch of them. You got to go where the public is, and so if you were to compile this master calendar of events, it gives you that opportunity to figure out where to find the critical mass of people. Uh, I was just going into our beautiful rec center today, and CDOT had a small table to get some input on on uh, you know I-25 going from 84th Avenue to 104th, and I'm like, how come they're not going to our Safe Streets Halloween on Saturday? I mean. You got, you're going to have hundreds, maybe thousands of people coming. So I wonder if that sort of thought has entered your mind in terms of trying to figure out where to reach masses of people. Yeah, thank you. Um, we don't currently have anything like that, and that's a really good idea. Um, recently, uh, we've been um, – one of those other uh, strategies is we've been um, – Partnering with CBOs and, and contracting CBOs um, when uh, leading projects, and so that's a that's been kind of the way that we know uh, what is going on in a specific community, um, and that's that's been the way that we've been um, targeting those uh, specific events. But um, this is a really great idea, uh, and definitely something that um, I'm going to make note of and and share with uh, the rest of the team. Director Harmon, so much. Uh, to piggyback off of Director Kondo's comment, we've had a lot of success in Lone Tree when we send large surveys to our large employers. It's incredible the amount of feedback we get back, especially regarding transit. So many um, are facing transit challenges prior to COVID and post. So just wanted to make note of that. And then also anytime we can include youth in outreach, I think is really impactful. They're our future. And if we can get into the schools and I mean, this would be great to integrate uh, some sort of comment within um, any of our youth at any age, never too young to start. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, 100%. Um, that's something we uh, were able to pilot with the, uh, we were doing a project in, in Edgewater, um, and uh, we did some engagement with youth, uh, and not only was it like so fun and um, inspirational, but um, I do think we, we got a lot of good feedback from them as well. Director Blink Binkley. Thanks. I was gonna say exactly the same thing, like getting into high school, I get a lot of feedback from my students about how they hate the bus and they're scared at the bus and things like that. Um, so I always try to pass that on. And then I was also just thinking, like, if you're getting the youth and getting into those schools, like, they're going to continue, at least some of them, to be, like, more involved in the community after that. But, yeah, that's a huge thing, I think. Thank you for bringing that up. Director Bear. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I really echo connecting with youth, so important. And then also um, going to where the people are. I know in my community, um, I've been talking to people, they've been asking me questions about what have you been doing uh, as I'm running my reelection campaign. And you know, one of the things is Dr. Cog, and they're like, oh, who's that? So, um, so connecting with people and really um, making sure that you're going to where the groups are. Like we have Boo on Briggs coming up 
um, that's a great place. And we hope that you, we have even more um, reasons for you to come to Erie and to do that outreach there. So thank you. Director Mills. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I really want to support what Dr. Director Kondo and ever, others have said. Um, it's, you know, we're past a lot of our summer celebrations, but it's a, some areas have a fall fest, a harvest fest. So get into those. I, I know of one of my communities, so feel free to reach out for more info. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Sorry, Director Barr. No worries. Um, I thank you for the presentation, and um, you know, I think one of the critical elements in planning documents like this is also acknowledging when Dr. Cog or Dr. Cog staff are not necessarily the ones to deliver a particular message. So, in your planning document, it, do you allow for you know essentially? Uh, I would say delegation of that kind of authority to kind of more appropriate local institutions, nonprofits, community-based organizations that can can take this plan and then carry it out. I guess what I'm asking is, is this plan only for you as Dr. Cog staff, or can this be utilized by other organizations with the same goal? Yeah, so um, this is mainly a, a resource for Dr. Cog staff and um, and it is a public facing document and something that we hope that the public can use as well. Um, and I think, I mean, the hope is that it's it's good enough that anybody can um, use it as a resource. Um, but our our two main audience when um, doing this update were the public and Dr. Cog staff. But we do have a lot of language in there on exactly what you had touched on. Um, when it's best for us to deliver the message and when it's best to um, turn to CBOs um, and, and other, um, yeah, local groups. All right, I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much, Kelsey. We appreciate you. your update. All right, we have informational items here. Um, administrative modifications to the fiscal year 2024-2027 transportation <laughs> improvement program. Josh Schwenk, Planner, Transportation Planning and Operations. Those are just, okay, no briefings on those, sorry. We're gonna go on to the committee reports. Um, again, we request that those reports be brief. Um, first one is a report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee stack. We have Director Steve Odoricio. Hello, how's that? All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, after, I think I told you last month that there was a, uh, a vote to change the bylaws on term limits, and as a result, we now have Gary Beattie, who represents the Eastern TPR, is, was elected as chair, and Holly Williams was re, uh, elected to represent the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments as vice chair. Uh, Stack also received an update from CDOT uh, staff regarding the ongoing strategic highway safety plan. Uh, we noted that the desire to have the plan set up a framework for prioritizing safety projects, funding on non-state highways. Also, there is a vibrant uh, discussion about the increase in enterprise funding and enterprises and what some folks feel is kind of stagnant or steady uh, or a lack of increasing of funding for um, some of the other, um, the other funding sources. And so there was a vibrant discussion on how we could try to have more transparency and participation in the governance and the distribution of funds from those new enterprises. Um, I think some of our friends in the other TPRs feel like these enterprises are a way to bypass some of these other governance structures and give it to some of the, um, let's just end it there. But yeah, so there, there's some concern about that and we need to all address that. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Next up is a report from Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Bud Starker. Uh, thank you, Chair. The Metro Mayor's Caucus met uh, on October the 2nd. I was not able to attend that meeting, but uh, uh, Director Conklin was able to attend that. And with the Chair's permission, I'd like to ask uh, Director Conklin to uh, give that report. Director Conklin. 
Thank you very much. And before I get to October 2nd, I wanted to mention on October 1st, uh, some members of the Metro Mayor's Caucus uh, came here to Dr. Cog and met with the Kosovo delegation that the State Department put, State Department put together. Uh, I think they may have been in many of your communities, but that was great, and we appreciate Dr. Cog hosting Metro Mayors for that event. Uh, the next day, on October 2nd, we did have our regular caucus meeting. Items included a front-range passenger rail update. Oh, we've had those here, too. Uh, a uh, presentation from Govern for America, which is connecting uh, emerging leaders with full-time jobs via their fellowships. And then also we had a presentation from Connect for Health Colorado. Uh, Kevin Pelson, executive director, and uh, their staff talking about Connect for Health and how that can help our communities and also potentially help our municipalities. And that can report on Metro Mayor's Caucus. Thank you very much. We have a report from Metro Area County Commissioners. George Teal's not here, so Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, last month, I reported that MAC has been working on their 2025 priorities, and uh, they're coming to the end of that, but they did have an opportunity at their last meeting, which was September 27th, to have a conversation with the governor's office staff um, about those priorities and really establishing that relationship between Act and the governor's office. I, I think it was a really, it was, it was a great conversation, and uh, I think we're going to have him back real soon to, to follow up on that conversation. Thank you. We're going to um, skip over advisory committee on aging and go to the regional air quality council again. Director Rex. Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir. Um, they met on uh, October first, I believe. Um, and a couple of things of note in this is that we had a. a presentation and conversation associated with control strategy concepts that we're looking at for the next um, next SIP update. Um, they also had a presentation on the, the 2024 RTD ballot measure. And um, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. We have a report from the E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Yeah, the, there were a number of things considered as always in a lot of contracts. The most notable was um, the toll plazas are going to be demolished and the process to have service area stops begun and that uh, lease was modified slightly. The IGA with Colorado Corrections was amended to allow for some wage increases and in performance incentives as well as other changes. There was a budget workshop in advance of um, consideration of the budget and uh, the new executive director, Joe Donahue, is a former employee, and he came back, and he's now getting together with the different communities. So Director Douglas would have um, been meeting with him, and, and yourself, Mr. Chair, uh, will be meeting with him to get to know the various communities that E-470 touches. Thank you. Uh, report from CDOT, Director Pakbas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the uh, items I do want to report that happened um, actually today is the US 50 bridge project um, is primarily complete and is open to traffic. Um, that middle bridge has been completed. So there's still some work that needs to be done on that bridge, but at least it's open to traffic and um, um, allowing folks to continue to commute in there. So did want to bring that up. At the Transportation Commission today, the, we had workshops on the fiscal year 26 budget, a uh, brief overview of the fuels impact enterprise budget the uh, bridge and tunnel enterprise budget as the Transportation Commission also serves as the board of directors for both of those enterprises, a presentation from our audit division and an update on the mountain rail project and that service development plan. And the commission will meet tomorrow to take for, uh, formal action on um, various items that they usually uh, take action on, such as uh, condemnations, of, excuse me, disposal, not condemnations, but um, and um, other budget amendments. And that's it for my report tonight, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, report from RTD, Director Siroy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple of things to note. Um, the board is considering our January service changes, which uh, I think the good news with that is it's probably the first time in a couple of years that we have fairly significant increases in service. So we're excited about that. There are public meetings. There are a couple of public meetings next week on the 21st and then on the 23rd. Um, comments can also be sent to um, service.change at rtd-denver.com. Um, also, um, those of you that have been on the mall know that there are four blocks of the mall that are now open, and the shuttles are started running this week. So 
pay attention. If you're walking, if you're used to walking in the middle of the street, there will be shuttles that we will be using that will be using the streets. So, oh. um, and then lastly, uh, just note that the downtown rail replacement project is completed. It did get completed a little bit early, and we do have trains running in the middle of downtown now. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to note that our next meeting is November 20th. Does any member have anything for the good of the group? Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Doug Rex, Executive Director Rex's suggestion, uh, just a point of personal uh, a note for me. Uh, the film that was based on the book that I wrote 40 years ago about the neo-Nazi Klan white nationalist terrorist group that assassinated KOA talk show host Alan Berg had its world premiere at the Denver at the uh, Venice Film Festival and I was I was able to attend uh, it stars Jude Law Nicholas Holt and a couple other young actors I never heard of uh, but this is this is a once in a lifetime uh, thing for me given the stage of my lifetime that I'm in but uh, <laughs> but I, I but I wanted to uh, I wanted to let you all know that if you wanted to uh, be part of the Denver premiere, it is being it is booked as the uh, centerpiece screening at the Denver Film Festival. November it'll be Friday, November 8, 7 p.m. in the Ellie Calkins Opera House at the Denver Performing Arts Complex. And uh, this is probably one of the most bizarre times of my life. N totally out of the blue after 40 years uh, to have this happen, but. Uh, I just want to let you all know if you wanted to attend, come up and say hi. <laughs> Anybody top that? <laughs> no. No. I, 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 your meals. I'll I let him wanna, try. I just want to ask Director Flynn, is, is there another opportunity outside of that date if maybe oh. I'm out of town? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the, the opening in theaters is December 6th. Wow. Friday, December 6th is the opening in theaters. Don't blink because movies don't last long in theaters for long. <laughs> but it's a great holiday movie. <laughs> 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 Director Levy. What are... oh. Yes. I'm sorry. The name of the film is The Order. And in conjunction... Uh, Simon and Schuster is going to reissue the book after oh, it's been out of wow. print for so long. So wow, that's really. So they make another ten bucks on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think I found it. I found Director it on Mauricio. What's the oh, Denver I, Film Festival? Uh, I was googling Denver Film Festival, and then you can there's links there to find it. So this is awesome, totally awesome. What was the date? November 8th. And Friday, then November 8th. Yeah. And then December for the normal public. December 6th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we make a motion? Everybody's going to know if the yeah. officers involved with transportation. All right. With no other business to hold, we are adjourned. Yeah. So now we make